You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works 266, the first of three volumes, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled From the Esoteric School, Esoteric Lessons from 1904 to 1909, translated by James H. Hines. I'm beginning now in this, I believe this is the uh, uh, 12th section uh, of the reading, and I'm beginning the year 1907. So this is the first esoteric lesson from Stuttgart, January 20th, 1907, manuscript from Alice Kinkel. Retrospection. In retrospection, we place ourselves into what was experienced in such a way that we properly feel the difference between our experience in the soul and the real experience in the external world. That is, as if we were to observe the picture of a landscape with our eyes closed, that is, a memory, compared to a real observation with eyes opened, that is, a direct beholding. That is the same relationship as the one between memory and retrospection. Memory is remembering and retrospection should be beholding in this case. Memory gradually disappears with initiates and a direct beholding of what one wants to remember takes its place. One must imagine a picture before oneself of the day's events, exactly and clearly, with all the details, shirt, face, manner, etc., everything exactly, and thus see the events in a picture, how someone spoke, what was done, etc. It is very important to call up into one's memory the small events that are not very interesting, that cost effort to remember, because in this way one's inner forces are stimulated. The power of imagination is created by exercising the capacity for forming mental pictures. The completeness of the experience is not important, but rather the clarity of the images. With all this work, no muscles are to be strained. As the light first had to form the external eyes and the body received the stimulation for creating other organs, now it is obligated to pass this on further to the astral body. This happens through all the activity of the physical body. Everything in the physical body is formed from outside, also the stomach and other inner organs. Thus, the organs of the astral body are formed through imagining pictures. The Auxiliary Exercises Again, we must begin here with thinking and continue until we achieve our goal of the feeling in question appearing. We must then pour this feeling into the body and thus practice this exercise for a month or longer before continuing on to the second and so on. Through this inpouring, the astral body acquires consistency, a firm shape, backbone. The first of these auxiliary exercises is control of thought. One takes an object and attempts to think about it for five minutes. Then a certain feeling must appear, which one then pours into the body. The less interesting the object is, the more useful it will be, since holding on to it in thought for five minutes will cost effort. The second is initiative in one's actions. It must be an action that one forces oneself to do. Third, 
overcoming pain and pleasure. Not that we do not feel joy or suffering, but rather that we do not allow them to rule us. Fourth, seek positivity in everything. Fifth, freedom from bias in all experiences. Sixth, repeat all five exercises rhythmically. Each of these auxiliary exercises is to be carried out until one can pour the corresponding feeling into the body and experience it. Only then should one proceed to the next month. Meditation As a first task in the morning, meditation is given to you. It is intended to awaken, to awaken powers. The lily is a visible expression of a word once spoken by the Creator. A great deal depends upon which words, which vowels are spoken, which thoughts, which feelings one sends out into world, because they will become visible at a time in which the earth will be in another state, in Venus and Jupiter states. Thus, what the three kingdoms of nature are here on the earth is the expression of what the inhabitants of the moon once spoke and thought. For this reason the mantras, also the words of meditation, are chosen in their wording and sequence of letters, just as they are, because they have their effect only in such a sequence. What is done and created by us will one day be visible on Jupiter, for example the cathedral in Cologne, Raphael's masterpieces, music, etc. The cathedral in Cologne will be visible as a grown formation. Raphael's paintings will be similar to Feta Morgana as clouds surrounding Jupiter. Music will sound forth on Jupiter as music of the spheres. In our exercises, we must think that the masters have intended something of this sort for us. That is the purpose of the exercises. And the verse, quote, In the spirit lay the seed of my body, etc., close quote, explains this to us. The old adepts in Atlantis expressed this succinctly in the holy word Aum. Ah is the past and sounds distinct and clear. U is a muffled vowel and represents the present. The clarity of the past and the freedom of the present to act are contained within it. M is the undetermined quality of the future to which every vowel, this or that action, can be adapted. Retrospection done properly awakens a powerful force in the soul that humans will need when they can one day ascend to the astral plane. From control of thoughts, the mastery of thought should arise. From initiative in one's actions, a drive toward work toward activity should appear, which one otherwise had not felt. Meditation should be the first work of the day in the morning. That is the end of that esoteric lesson. The next esoteric lesson is from Berlin, January 29th, 1907. Record A is a manuscript from Matilda Scholl and Anna Weissmann. Record B, manuscript from Camilla Wandry and Anonymous. Record A. Because several are here today who have never attended an esoteric lesson, we want to try to better understand the exercises we all must do. First, we want to speak of the morning meditation and become clear on the effects of meditation. Streams of spiritual life are always flowing through the world. But when we are occupied with the thoughts of everyday life, those streams cannot flow into us. Our words of meditation are 
like doors, like gates that should lead us into the spiritual world. They have the power to open our souls so that the thoughts of our great leaders, the masters of wisdom and harmony of feelings, can stream into us. However, for this to happen, the deepest stillness must reign in us. We must be clear that meditation is a most intimate undertaking of the soul. Thus, immediately after awakening, when no other thoughts have yet passed through the soul, we should allow the words of meditation given to us by our teacher to live in our soul. However, we should not regard them as content for speculation and philosophizing. Indeed, we should reflect on their meaning and significance as little as possible. We have time for reflection the entire rest of the day. We should keep that far away from meditation. Neither should we repeat the words in a meaningless fashion, but we should be clear that these words open our souls to the inflowing of divine beings as a flower opens to let in the light of the sun. Lofty spiritual beings stream down to us, above all, however, the thoughts of those whom we call Master. We want to be clear that it is they above all who guide us and are near to us in meditation. We should also know that they walk on the earth incarnated in physical bodies. Thus, we should allow the words of meditation to live in our soul without pondering. We should rather attempt to grasp the spiritual content of the words with our feelings and to permeate ourselves with them. The power of these words lies not only in the thoughts that are expressed, but also in the rhythm and sound of the words. We should listen for that. And when we have also excluded everything sensory, we can say that we should wallow in the sound of the words. Because the sound of the words is so important, it is not an easy matter to translate a meditative verse into a foreign language. The meditative verses we have received in the German language have been brought to us directly out of the spiritual world. Every set form of words, every prayer, has its greatest effect in its original language. When Indians want to express their greatest devotion for the God who reveals himself in the three Logoi, they summarize their feeling in three sayings that characterize the activity of the three Logoi. In English, these three sayings are Primal Truth, Primal Goodness, Infinitude, O Brahma, Primal Blessedness, Eternity, Primal Beauty, Peace, Blessing, Oneness, Aum, Peace, Peace, Peace. But the entire fullness of spiritual power is only given if the words are said in Sanskrit, the original language, especially when they are spoken out loud. Then one can hear how even the air is resonating with the words. They are, and my apologies for trying this, Satyam Jananam Anantam Brahma Anandarupam Amritam Bibharti Shantam Shivam, Advaitam, Om, Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. It is exactly the same with the Lord's Prayer. Spoken in the German language, it is almost only the only underlying thought that is effective. The Latin Pater Noster is already more effective, but the entire force and fullness comes to expression only in the original Aramaic language. Thus we should listen our way entirely into the sound of the words. But we should also refrain from all spatial images. We should stay with the impressions that are directly connected with our senses. In ordinary life our thoughts are so empty and without content. We should bring life 
to our mental pictures. For example, with the word scoop, we have a mental image as vividly graphic as possible, such as when someone scoops up water with his or her hands. All of our thoughts should be as full of content, as pictorial as possible. Now when meditating, the words of meditation should acquire inner life. However, we should also exclude all conceptions of space and adhere entirely to the meaning. That means that the spatial way of seeing exists only on the physical plane, but not in the astral world. However, everything connected with the senses, color, light, sound, smell, and so forth, is also present in the astral world. For that reason, when meditating, we should seek to awaken a content-filled, sensual mental picture as clearly as possible. Spiritual beings express themselves in everything that the senses perceive. Their being streams to us in colors, sounds, and smells. And when we connect ourselves with certain sense impressions, certain beings flow into us. The first logos streams to us as world aroma, as a clearly perceptible smell. A spiritual being of a higher or lower nature lives in every smell. Very good, lofty beings live in incense. They draw us up directly to God. Beings of lower order are incarnated in musk fragrance. In earlier times, when people understood even more about these things, one used musk to stimulate lower sensuality. Thus, spiritual beings also live in sounds and colors. And we should feel, feel through and through, the words of meditation in our soul as colorfully, as light-filled and sound-filled as possible. We should live entirely within them. For example, if a meditation begins, quote, in pure rays of light, close quote, and so forth, then one should have a clear, light-filled mental picture. One should see and feel how the streams of light flood down upon one. Then it must still be said that it is not at all important for us to receive new exercises as fast as possible. On the contrary, the power in the soul of humans is shown when they remain with an exercise for the longest possible time, when they are able to draw power from it for a long time. Every meditation is filled with power, for which a long time is required in order to awaken the slumbering forces in the soul. However, when one is always longing for new instructions, then one destroys the power of the exercise and kills its fruit. There are certain elementary esoteric schools where the pupils receive very simple instruction. These do not lead to any goal, but we can learn what such simple exercises can have for an effect when they are properly done. For example, the pupil gets the task to think only on a single mental picture for a quarter hour. Glass, glass, glass. This is not laughable. For if during this period of time the pupil really manages to exclude every other thought from his or her soul, then his or her soul will become entirely empty and pure, and the forces slumbering in the soul will awaken, unless other influences are too strong. Thus we see that such simple exercises can also be effective. Nevertheless, such exercises are not given in our school. Our meditations contain powerful spiritual forces. They are gates into the spiritual world. The further pupils advance, the simpler the exercises that they receive become. The exercises become simpler and simpler the more the spiritual forces awaken. Now we also want to talk about evening retrospection. Every evening before going to sleep, we should go back through our day 
from the end to the beginning. The day should pass us by in pictures. One thing is important in doing this, namely, that we never allow a feeling of regret to arise. Regret is always egotistical. Those who regret wish themselves to have been better. They have an entirely egotistical wish. We should learn from our daily life. When we have done something bad, we should not regret, but rather think, at that time I was not able to act otherwise. Now, however, I can do it better and want to do it better in the future. With each experience of the day, we should ask ourselves, did I do it rightly? Should I not? Should I have not done it better? One will always find that one could have done it better. In doing this, one thing is very important, that we learn to look upon ourselves as a stranger, as if we observed and criticized ourselves from the outside. Altogether, we should get a mental picture of the day as clearly as possible. It is much more important to remember small details than important incidents. A general who has fought a great battle immediately has a picture of the battle before his or her eyes that evening. That sticks in his mind by itself. However, all the little details of the day, for example, how he put his boots on and took them off, he no longer knows. And this is what is important, that we have a picture of the day as complete as possible. For example, we see ourselves walking down the street and we try to remember how the rows of houses went, which window displays we walked past, which people met us, how they looked, how we ourselves looked. Then we see ourselves going into a shop and remember which sales associates came to meet us, what they wore, how they spoke and moved. We must strive very hard to remember such small details. This strengthens the forces of the soul. One must not think that one needs an hour for this. At first one will remember little, and then gradually, with great effort, more and more. Finally, however, one can with practice reach the point where the entire life of the day can pass through the soul-like paintings on a wall, clearly and with all details, in five minutes. However, one must strive patiently. For those who quickly repeat the events of the day only superficially, registering them without color, this exercise is of no use at all. What should be intended through this exercise is as follows. If we have walked a long path, and at the end of the path would once again like to know the way we have come, we can do so in two ways. First of all, we could stand with our backs to the path just traveled and attempt to remember what lies behind us. We can, however, also turn around and survey the path. Now, when we have traversed a period of time, to begin with, we can only think back with our memory and not look back at the interval of time that has passed. But this looking back, which we know only in space, is also possible in time. And we can learn to do it by trying to let the day that has just ended pass through our consciousness clearly and as graphically and concretely as possible. No event of the past is entirely gone. It is still present in what we call the Akashic Chronicle. Only in this way does one learn to read it. At first one only recognizes, within it, what concerns oneself, gradually what concerns others. For this reason the evening retrospection is such an important, indispensable exercise. Esoteric pupils can observe something strange about themselves. They can notice that their memories constantly become worse and worse. This is entirely natural. But it will soon get better, or, more accurately, memory will disappear, and something new will take its place. 
the new faculty will be the ability to see the past directly. Then one no longer needs an ordinary memory. Aside from meditation and retrospection, pupils must do certain auxiliary exercises. They are intended not to develop new capacities, but rather to strengthen the character of their soul and to shape it into the proper form. Only when these auxiliary exercises are done can the success of meditation be beneficial. The first auxiliary exercise is this, that, once a day, when we have a few moments undisturbed, we take a thought, place it in the center of our thoughts, and remain with it for at least five minutes. When one begins to do this exercise, one should choose the simplest, apparently empty mental picture possible and think through, in a calm sequence, everything that can be thought about it and in connection with it. If one chooses an interesting object, then thoughts will attach themselves to it. However, if one chooses, for example, a match stick, then one must make great efforts to continue reflecting on it for a longer period of time. And it is just this effort that awakens the forces in the soul. One can think here somewhat as follows. How does a matchstick look? What different kinds of matchsticks are there? How are they made? What are they good for? How are they stored? What kind of damage can they do? And so forth. If one does this exercise, then after a time one will feel an inner certainty and stability after the exercise. This is a very specific feeling. One tries to become very conscious of it, and then, as if it were water, pour it onto the head and spinal cord. One must do this exercise daily, at least for four weeks. However, one can also do this exercise for months until one feels that it is bearing good fruit. Secondly, we should practice initiative in action. To this end, one chooses actions that one otherwise would not have done and that are undertaken only for the sake of this exercise. Exercises as simple as possible, to which one must force oneself, are the most effective for the beginning. Again, one soon notices a certain feeling, a stability, and the drive to initiate action. One should guide this feeling in full consciousness and pour it, like water, from the head down into the heart in order to embody it entirely. One does not, excuse me, one does this exercise for a certain time, again, at least four weeks. In the third month, or after the second period, one begins to bring an end to all the swings in one's soul life, all, quote, jubilating, heaven-high, depressed until death, close quote, must disappear. No pain must be allowed to oppress. No joy must be allowed to lift one out of oneself. Fear, excitement, and agitation, and discomposure must disappear. In this way, one creates a third feeling within oneself. This feeling of calm equanimity makes itself perceptible as an inner warmth. We concentrate this feeling in the heart and then let it radiate from there into our hands, into our feet, and then toward the head. After the third period, one creates in the soul what one calls positivity. One tries to see the good and the beautiful in everything, even in the worst, most horrible and ugliest things, as the Persian legend of Christ with the dead dog teaches us. Here one will one day sense a feeling of inner blessedness. This one concentrates in the heart, lets it radiate to the head, and from there out through the eyes. In the fifth month, one practices never allowing one's future 
to be determined by the past. One must become entirely free of prejudice. One must take in everything with an open soul. If someone says the church tower over there was rotated during the night, then one must not laugh, but rather think. Perhaps there is a law of nature that I do not know. Then one will soon sense a feeling as if something were streaming toward one from the space around one. This one absorbs, so to speak, through the eyes, ears, and the entire skin. In the sixth period, all five exercises should be done simultaneously in order to create a harmonious resonance. It should also be mentioned that one should try not to allow too great a time difference between the duration of the morning meditation and the duration of the evening retrospection. All those who wish to become true esotericists must be clear about the fact that they will achieve what all of humanity will one day achieve, only in a shorter period of time. And the idea must be firmly instilled in their minds that one day great tasks will come to them, that one day they will be needed for the further evolution of humanity. This thought, this goal, must live deeply within them. Otherwise they are not esotericists in the true sense. And when they develop in this way into the future, then their eyes will also be opened concerning the past, and then the present will be understandable from the future and the past. Past, present, and future will thus be harmoniously united. The great masters placed this also into the language in the holy syllable, Aum. That is one of the many interpretations that can be given to this syllable. When we speak this syllable, the great masters are here with us, and the air resonates with the spiritual power of this sound, Aum. Readers aside, there's a chart here. I won't read it. Uh, it needs to be looked at. End of readers aside. Azuras, the beings that strive for the eighth sphere. They want to condense matter, increasingly to press it together, so to speak, so that it cannot be spiritualized again, that is, led back to its original state. They are the, in quotes, dregs of the entire planetary evolution, which begins with Saturn and goes through the Sun, Moon, Earth, Jupiter, Venus, Vulcan. The Azuras already inhabit the Moon and influence human beings whom they wish to pull down into the Eighth Sphere and thus tear them away from progressive evolution and their goal, the Christ. All who are striving toward the Eighth Sphere will ultimately find their existence on a moon, in parentheses, Jupiter. Aum, invocation for defending against evil influences. Properly spoken, Aum connects people with creative divinity, the three Logoi, against which no evil being who would like to pull humans away from God can stand. Aum must be spoken in one's consciousness. Quote, archetypal self, from whom everything has come forth. Archetypal self, to whom everything returns. Archetypal self, who lives in me, toward you I strive. Peace, 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 Aum. Quote, in pain you shall bear children, close quote, is the symbolic saying that is related to humanity's progress through reincarnation, whose ennobling is achieved through suffering. Humans redeem themselves and the Luciferic beings through true knowledge of Christ, through a wisdom that wants to understand an evolution of the earth with Christ within, but only through a consciousness that wants to know Christ. If humans allow themselves to be unconsciously saved, then they contribute nothing to the salvation of Lucifer. You can be enlightened by the Holy Spirit, 
the new spirit, which is no other spirit than the spirit by which Christ is understood. Lucifer is the bearer of the torch of this light, the light of Christ. He is the spirit who holds sway over the lodge of twelve as the thirteenth. Manas is a spiritual self-consciousness in itself and divine consciousness when the human being unites it with buddhi. Only the human being who has given birth to the higher self can do this. It is hidden in the Aum. A is Atman. U is buddhi. M is wisdom that leads the higher self to Aum. That is the end of that esoteric lesson. The next esoteric lesson was given in Hamburg on February 11th, 1907. Record A is notes from Matilda Hoyer. Record B, notes from Amelie Wagner. Record A. Logos. Most people know little more than the fact that the word consists of five letters. Speaking about these lofty beings, about the three Logoi, is often only an amateurish talking around the subject. In order to look into the world of the three Logoi, an encompassing preparation is required to understand. But people often believe that they can understand the very highest truths right at first. In theosophical writings, the Logoi are often spoken of as the fabric of life of the world. Such an understanding can only be impoverished compared to that to which we must raise ourselves if we wish to approach the world of the three Logoi. In order to come to a certain understanding of what is meant with the Logoi, we will place before our soul the beginning of John's Gospel, quote, In the very beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Everything was made by the same, and without it, nothing of what was created came to be. Close quote. If we let this resonate in our soul, then we can sense that something most lofty and sublime has been touched. If we remember what is said concerning the evolution of the earth, then we know that our planet has evolved out of another planet, Old Moon. On Old Moon, all the beings were different. The moon condition was also different from the present day condition of our earth. It was not solid, but in a fluid condition. Before the moon condition, the sun itself was the incarnation of our earth, and similarly before that was the Saturn condition. Thus our earth has passed through three embodiments. Now, how is the present-day sun related to that planet which, before the moon condition, was the sun condition of our earth? A promotion has taken place. The sun, which is now a fixed star, was formerly the sun planet. The best powers and beings have been distilled from this planet sun, and those who were less developed then went on further with the moon, came to the earth, and have carried out their evolution on the earth. From every planet one day a fixed star will evolve. Our earth is not merely a dead body. It is an ensouled being. The souls that are incarnated in the three kingdoms of nature, human souls and yet higher spiritual beings, are united with our earth. When a planet evolves into a fixed star, then the beings who are incarnated on the planet also ascend higher. The best forces and beings of the former sun have become a fixed star. When our earth has gone through the Jupiter and Venus conditions and is already almost sun, then human beings will be similar to the lofty beings that today inhabit the sun. And what will then become of our sun? From a sun a zodiac evolves. When a sun has attained its maturity, then a structure is formed that we call a zodiac. 
beings even more powerful and lofty than those from a sun, are at work, sending down forces from a zodiac. The sun that is shining down upon us will one day shine down as the stars of a new zodiac. Creative beings of the highest evolution will be spiritual beings of this new zodiac, creative souls. When we consider human evolution, we see the organs that wither, that are at the end of their development. On the other hand, we also see others that stand at the beginning of their evolution. In the future, the heart will be a voluntary muscle. This evolution is happening while the earth, at the same time, is being transformed from a planet into a sun. And what can our larynx do today? Through the spoken word it can spread the thoughts in our soul into the world around us. Thoughts are first in our soul, then they are transformed through the spoken word into vibrations in the air. That is only the beginning of their development. What now serves as organs for human reproduction will wither, and the larynx will serve as the new organ of reproduction. Just as humans today incarnate their thoughts in vibrations in the air through speaking, so too in the future through speech they will reproduce their kind through a new organ of reproduction, the larynx. This will occur when the earth evolves from a planet to a sun and from a sun to a zodiac. Then the human being will speak into the world, and the world will be creative. Thus our world has come into being. Beings who have evolved through earlier worlds, yet before the earth was Saturn, sounded forth the creative word when the earth was at the beginning of its evolution. Quote, in the beginning was the word, close quote. At the end of evolution, humans will themselves be a creative logos. They will be beings that create through the word. They have come forth from a creative logos and will later themselves be a creative logos. We speak of three logoi, of that which we call the trinity, the creative word, which is the third logos. It is the sound of the world that sounds through the world from the beings that have become creative through the word. There are yet higher, loftier powers. They are the creative light. The human being will also one day be a luminous being. Warmth raised to a higher stage becomes light, quote, All warmth is sacrifice, close parenthesis. Humans will in the distant future not only be, in quotes, sound, they will evolve into a radiant, luminous being that is light. That lofty being that is creative for our being is the second logos, which is the creative light. What goes through the world as the highest revelation, that is the aroma of the world. That is a principle of creation yet higher than the sound of the world and the light of the world. The tone of the world is the third logos, the light of the world is the second logos, and the aroma of the world is the first logos. That is the highest. When what is the highest creative force is transformed into its opposite, then it is something that destroys Here we have the opposite of the aroma of the world. When the devil is given a bad odor in folk tales, that is to indicate the destructive being of the world. What always remains through all evolution as the eternal in the human being, that is called in esotericism the personal aroma of the spirit of the human being. I'll read the small chart left. I'll read the left side going down. Sound of the world, ear, hearing in the physical, Saturn. Next to that, light of the world, eyes, sight, in the etheric, sun. 
and between those two below is the word feeling. Now the far right and between the middle and the right is the word taste at the bottom is on the right aroma of the world, nose, smell in the astral, moon. And that is the end of record A. Record B. I want to try to hold on to some of what we have heard so that perhaps when reading through it again later, a reminder of what was experienced will come alive. At first, Steiner tried to lead us deeper into the way we should meditate. We should imagine what we say as graphically as possible. We should not reflect on the words, for then we would find out only that that which we already know, but rather we should look at the words and immerse ourselves in them, Then they will gradually say something to us. Through these exercises we are making it possible for the divine beings higher above us as well as the masters, our older brothers, to guide the streams of life that flow through the world into us. That is the purpose of the exercises. Quote, More radiant than the sun. Retrospection. To begin with, memory will suffer from these exercises, but do not worry, that is only a transition. Then one will look back, learn from what is experienced, without regret. Strictly speaking, regret would be a kind of egotism, vanity, arrogance. One would gladly be better than one is. During retrospection, this feeling must be completely excluded. By means of this continuing, conscientious exercise, we create an organ for the Master that he needs in order to work in us. If we walk through a region and come to a rest and want to survey the path we have walked, then we can do this in two kinds of ways. We can close our eyes and remember everything that went past us on the path, or we can turn around and look back. This works on the physical plane. We know this in space, but not in time. What we need to learn is how to read the Akashic Chronicle, nature's memory. Everything we have done is stored there. Quote, concerning the three Logoi. If we want to arrive at a correct understanding of them, then we must create a sensory mental picture without speculating. The first Logos is the smell or aroma of the world, of which earthly aroma is only a weak reflection. Into that the second Logos was poured, the light, quote, I am the light of the world, close quote, literally, close parenthesis. All visible light, even sunlight, is only a weak reflection of the light that the second Logos streams forth. The third Logos is sound, the music of the spheres. We are more able to imagine the nature of sound because we ourselves have sound in language, in the sounds that come forth from our larynx. Thus the ancient Turanian adepts taught many thousands of years ago on Atlantis. Ah, the wide open encompassing sound, the third logos, the muffled vowel, ooh, sound, the light, concerning which we still have no idea the second Logos, and the consonant M sound, the unspeakable, the aroma of the world, the first Logos. That's the end of record B, and that's the end of the first of three sections on the 1907 Esoteric Lessons.